fairly recently in the hobby, we have seen the introduction of so many problems at the beginning stages of putting an aquarium together from cyanobacteria to massive diatom blooms, dinoflagellates, and other issues that are just being really annoying for people to get sorted before their tank can really begin to mature. And it all starts with this, dead rock. In this video, we're going to talk about the differences between dead rock like this and live rock that actually comes from the ocean or maybe even a very long running system. We're going to compare and contrast these, talk about the pros and cons, and I'm going to give you some final thoughts. So let's start out with the good stuff, live rock. This comes from those established sources that I was talking about, or even in the oceans, and it comes already preloaded with tons of species of bacteria, microfauna like copepods and amphipods and feather duster worms, and all of this stuff is excellent things to have in your aquarium. Adding live rock to your tank is going to establish various anaerobic, aerobic, and anoxic zones in the tank that are going to let these bacteria do different jobs for you in processing the nutrients that end up in the tank and turning them into useful things to allow your aquarium to grow. Using live rock in your tank is going to allow for a faster and more complete nitrogen cycle. And if you start the tank with it right from the rip, you may never actually experience a nitrogen cycle on your test kits at all. It's entirely possible to set up a tank with live rock and live sand from day one, add your fish, add some corals, add some cleaners, and you are immediately off to the races. Something that takes two to three months at the minimum, if you're using dead base rock. This is going to function as a true biological foundation for your tank, not just surface area for things to begin inhabiting when you start going through the nitrogen cycle. It's going to instantly add this biodiversity to your tank, which is going to support not only coral health, but also help suppress those ugly phase things that I was mentioning earlier that we don't want in our tanks. Live rock has already reached a state of stasis with these organisms and they just don't grow as readily when there are other organisms that can outcompete the bad stuff right off the rip. But it does not come without its intricacies. There are a couple of downsides to live rock. Number one, most the thing that people usually say is the most problematic is the cost. And I do agree. It is very expensive. But later in the video, I'm going to make a point about that. So make sure you stick around for that. Oh, hey, by the way, if you've never met me, if you've never seen my videos before, my name is Logan and I run Reef Rookies, the most respectful reef keeping community on all of the internet. We're here on YouTube. I'm also on TikTok and Instagram, and we have a Facebook group by the same name. And we would love to have you be a part of that group. And I would like to send a thanks out there to all my new YouTube channel members. You guys are what allow me to keep doing this full time and bringing this kind of information to you. The second most popular thing that people like to discuss when we're talking about live rock is that you might end up with some pest organisms in your aquarium. Bristle worms and fire worms, gorilla crabs are often mentioned, and there's several other things that people talk about that you can get from live rock, but almost all of them are very easily remedied either by using a trap of some kind or just a simple quarantine of the live rocks before you set the tank up. You can even run the rocks in a tank of high salinity, higher than you're going to run it in the aquarium, dip the rocks in that high salinity water, and things that don't like that environment are going to crawl out of the rocks and fall into the water and you can get them out. And here's a counterpoint for you really quick. If you want to get the benefits of adding the live rock to your aquarium, the bacteria and microbial diversity, but you don't want those pests for sure, then consider getting live rock rubble or even just live sand. You're going to get some of the benefits, not all of them, but you're definitely going to be able to see pest organisms and, and things more clearly in rock rubble or sand than you do in very extremely porous live rock where they can get up in there and hide. Some of the common sources that I like to use are Marco rocks and Tampa Bay saltwater live rock. 
I've had really good experiences with those. And yes, they did come with a couple of extra organisms, but as I mentioned, those were easily remedied with a quick quarantine, little net to grab the gorilla crab, no big deal. Now, on the other hand, let's talk about dead base rock for a few minutes. It's clean, it's crisp, it's white, it's sterile. You know for certain that you're not putting anything bad into the tank right off the bat, but it doesn't have any biological or microbial life and nothing that we can get in a bottle on a shelf in a store even comes close to the diversity that you get from live rock from an established source. Even if that source is a long time running aquarium and it's been down in a sump in a dark area or something like that, it's just not even nearly the same. And in addition to that, some bottled bacteria has been shown to have some very nasty bugs in it that we don't want anywhere around us. More on that in a bit. Getting dead rock to the position of being live takes many, many, many months and a lot of seeding from various sources. And I'm not talking about bottled sources here. You're going to have to get corals and you're going to have to get other rocks from other places and put them in the tank and seed the tank with them to bring this biodiversity into the aquarium. And that takes a very long time. One of the things that helps keep pest organisms like dinoflagellates and diatoms and cyano, etc. away, and even some hair algaes and stuff like that, is the, the living biofilm that is found on the live rocks. You don't have that with dead rock. This is going to create an extended cycling phase. Sometimes you end up with a secondary or even a tertiary spike in nutrients during the nitrogen cycle. And it's also potentially going to extend the ugly phase time of your aquarium where you have that diatom bloom and the whole tank turns brown. What this is, is an establishing of the different bacterial colonies and microbial colonies in the aquarium. As one thing grows, it begins to outcompete something else. Well, then a new species is introduced in the tank because you put some corals or something in there from somewhere else. And as that species begins to grow, the other species might begin to die off. This sort of back and forth seesawing kind of thing keeps your tank in a state of instability. My tank right back here was set up with dead rock many months ago. And even now, it doesn't have anywhere near the look of this live rock that came from Tampa Bay saltwater and has only been in this tank for a couple of months. This live rock already has coralline algae on it in both pink and red strains. There's feathered dusters, and this tank is absolutely busting with copepods and amphipods. And yes, there are bristle worms in there. I put those in my tank on purpose. So now let's get into a little bit of the discussion about cost that I mentioned earlier. Yes, live rock is expensive. It is a high initial investment and it's a little bit calculated for when you add it to the aquarium. You have to already have your water made and the aquarium has to be running at the right temperature and these kinds of things before you put the live rock in there. But if we contrast that with using dead rock, and then you have to buy bottled ammonia and you have to buy bottles of bacteria and then you have to get rock and corals and stuff from somewhere else to begin adding that diversity. And let's just say you come up with a dinoflagellate bloom. Well, now you need to buy a microscope to identify the species of dinoflagellates that you have. And you have to buy sodium silicate in some cases or a UV sterilizer to combat the dinoflagellates. And then after that, you get cyanobacteria because things are going all out of whack. So you end up having to do things to combat the cyanobacteria. And this just goes on and on and on until the tank finally reaches a state of equilibrium and all that bad crap stops growing. The cost in the end can sometimes be equal to or even higher than the cost that you would have paid if you just got some live rock shipped to your house. Not to mention the absolute frustration that comes with dealing with back to back to back to back problem animals from the beginning for the first six to eight months before things finally calm down. I can guarantee you if you start an aquarium with live rock over dead rock, you are going to find more enjoyment in that aquarium faster than you will using the dead stuff. Now let's shift the target of the conversation for just a minute over into bottled bacteria. 
We love to say that this is a great product to use, but is it really? Some of the beneficial things, and look, I've recommended this stuff a lot because it's what we have available to us. But some of the things is, you know, it can help with the nitrogen cycle, which is true. We have seen that. It can help with bacterial diversity, which is true. We've seen that too. It can help fight off some of that ugly stuff that we don't want. That is true as well. But it does not come with no downsides. Many of the species that are found in the bottles of bacteria that we get are not marine species at all. And some of them are not even aquatic species. They're terrestrial bacteria strains that die off when we put them in our tank. These types of bacteria do not reproduce in our aquariums and they don't establish long-term populations. Ask yourself, why some of the bottle bacteria manufacturers recommend that you continually dose your aquarium with that bottled bacteria over time with no indication of when you can ever stop. Frequently online, you'll see some of these, and I'm not going to call out any one specific bacteria, but you will see them slated as a product that you can use to lower nitrates and phosphates. Well, if we're going to put a bacteria into the tank that's going to help us lower nitrates and phosphates, and that bacteria would then grow in population and, and keep controlling those things. Why would we have to keep adding them over and over and over, week to week to week to month to month to month? It's because they don't survive in the tank. They go in the tank, they consume some nitrates and phosphates as the end of their life is happening, they die, and then they're removed by the filtration. And that's the export method for those nutrients. Wouldn't it be better to just put bacteria in the tank and microfauna in the tank right from the beginning that are not only going to do that job, but are also going to grow and expand in population in our tank. I think so. Basically what this is doing is giving you a nutrient source without ecological establishment. So you have to keep buying that product over and over and over and over again and adding it to your tank. Additionally, bottled bacteria don't add any microfauna at all. You're not going to get a bottle of feather duster worms or a bottle that has amphipods in it. Now we can buy those things and, and we all know that, but what I'm talking about is the stuff that you see on the shelf at the big box stores and at your local fish store that's been on the shelf and been sealed for a while, labeled marine bacteria, you know, and stuff like that. It just doesn't have that microfauna in it. It's just bacteria that has been cultured, mind you, without regulation. And I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute. And in addition to all that, the effectiveness of this bacteria depends heavily on the age and the concentration of the bacteria that's inside that bottle and many other factors that you have absolutely no control over. And the problem that we have with this is if we start with dead base dry rock, we have to add bacteria in some way. And that's the easiest way to get it done, right? Just go to the fish store, you get a couple bottles of bacteria, you dump it in the tank and you're good to go. But you're really not. And that's the problem. Live Rock introduces hundreds of different species and strains of bacteria and microfauna. Anything we get from a bottle is going to be a handful up to a couple of dozen at best. And some of those species are things that we really probably don't want around us. Now, before I get into the next section of this video, I want to give you a disclaimer. I don't think that this was a real scientific study. It was not done through the scientific method. So what I'm about to say is largely anecdotal, but it is the beginnings of people beginning to think about this and really go down the path of figuring out whether or not this is a good thing. There's a guy and he's on Instagram uh, under the username Telegram. And he was also posting over on Reef to Reef. And he purchased a bunch of these bottled bacterias and did aquabiomics DNA testing on them to find out what bacteria are in the bottle. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole thing here. If you want to go find that, you can Google bacteria in a bottle DNA testing telegram, and you'll start to find the links where you can find all of those threads. Some of them are over 20 pages long, and it's tons of reading, and you have to filter through all of the, the anecdotal comments and stuff like that to find the data. But in the end, what was found is that 
Most of the species are not marine species anyway. There are a few, but most aren't. And there are even things like Staphylococcus aureus, which is a human pathogen found in those samples. Now, there were a few other human pathogens and fish pathogens and things like that found in there. And even though we haven't really dove deep into and studied this heavily, that tells you that the conditions in which these bacteria are cultivated are not lab grade, they are not sterile, and they are being contaminated in some way. And I suspect that his methods tried to keep contamination down as much as possible. But what is to say of the lab where these things were grown in, right? We don't know. There was at least one person on there who was a professional in the field who was saying that it would take more than something like a sick worker at these places coughing or being over the sample and touching themselves and touching the sample to result in the amount of some of these bad bacteria that were in these samples. He basically said that what it came down to is the samples were contaminated as they were being cultivated and it resulted in these findings. So let's get this down and boil it down to the bottom line, right? Bottled bacteria is a tool. It is not ever going to be a replacement for what we can get from nature. Most bottled bacteria seems to be engineered in the way that you have to keep continually purchasing that bottled bacteria time and time and time and time again. There are bacteria coming out on the market now like purple non-sulfur bacteria if you look into that and these are marine species and some companies like Microbe Lift especially their special blend of bacteria, that bottle, it has that purple non-sulfur bacteria in it. But what else is in there? Don't know. He did dig into that one, I believe. So if you want to go look that up and dig into that yourself, feel free. Live Rock, in every single case, is going to build a faster, more robust, more stable system right from day one than anything you can do with dry rock. Even if you set your tank up with dry rock and seed it with live rock, it's not as good as just putting live rock in the tank. And finally, the cost difference is an illusion, as I was talking about earlier. By the time you get done taking care of all the problems that you may end up facing from using that dry rock in your tank, you could have just had live rock anyway. Now, don't get me wrong here. That is not to say that dry rock doesn't have its place in the hobby. I could not have built this aquascape that I did with live rock. This took me a couple of weeks to do. There's no way I could have done that with live rock. And I am suffering the consequences now of this tank taking months to finally begin maturing. And it just goes to drive the point home even further that there's more than one way to keep a reef tank. Now, what I need you to do is to watch this video up on the screen. It's gonna give you more information about what you need to do to be successful in reef keeping. And I'm gonna catch you over there.